Well, thank you all for bearing with us through the long afternoon. We, we now have the most exciting subject of the day, which is, which is the law. Uh, uh, all of us here on this panel are, are law professors in one way or another, but we're going to try really hard not to be, not to be too law professorish. Um, <laughs> we're going to try really hard, in fact, to focus on uh, issues that are at the intersection of law and policy. Um, I'm Rosa Brooks. I'm a law professor at Georgetown and a fellow at New America in the Future of War Project. And I'm going to just very briefly introduce our panelists. Then I'm going to, we're going to try to keep this as conversational as we possibly can. I'm going to throw out some, first a general question for all of them, and then hopefully we'll dive down a little bit more. And after about half an hour, we will, we will go to you in the audience to see what you think. Uh, starting here, we've uh, Major General Charlie Dunlap, who is a retired uh, Air Force Deputy Judge Advocate General and now teaching at Duke Law School. Uh, next to him, we have Bill Banks uh, at Syracuse University, who's the founding director of the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism. Uh, next to Bill, we have Naz Modirzadeh, uh, who's the founding director of Harvard Law School's program on international law and armed conflict. And then uh, sitting next to Naz, we have Professor Laura Dickinson at George Washington University Law School, uh, who has written extensively on the privatization of uh, 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 private military and security contractors and emerging technologies and the effect on law. So let me, let me begin by throwing out a fairly general question. I was at a, an event sponsored by another think tank in town yesterday at the uh, center, uh, CSIS, and the topic of the uh, workshop I was sitting in was more or less the same as our topic today. And the, the, the starting premise was that the application of law to real world events has become increasingly complex and difficult and that the normative foundations of the law of armed conflict, if there ever were any, were severely undermined by the events of 9-11. Uh, and that since then, legal certainty has been elusive or illusory. Uh, that we no, no, we no longer even really know what a war is, when the law of armed conflict applies, when some other body of law applies, who can be targeted, who can be detained, uh, is the war, where is the war, does it have any geographical boundaries at all, do we know when wars begin or end, do we know who is a combatant in wars, and obviously this matters uh, if we think that there is an armed conflict uh, with Al-Qaeda and its associated forces, that extends to Yemen, then US drone strikes in Yemen are the lawful targeting of enemy combatants. If we think that you can't call that an armed conflict, then they look like murder or something else at any rate. Uh, so a lot hinges on our ability to tell the difference between war and not war. Uh, can we do that in any meaningful way or do we need to really wholesale reconsider a lot of our assumptions about the law? Let's just go down the line here. Charlie, what do you think? I think the law exists. I think the problem that we, and, and it is workable, the fact that it's complex, there's lots of things in this world that are complex. Bombing Baghdad is complex. It doesn't mean that we're not going to you know, do those kinds of operations. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have today is discerning the facts. If we could get the facts clear, then the law is there, especially when you look at the fundamentals of the law of armed conflict. Why don't I stop there and let our rest of the panel. Yeah, so one of the reasons that the, that the questions about war are so much more difficult now is that we don't, most of the time, find ourselves in state-on-state -state wars. We're in conflicts with non-state actors. And the, the rubric and framework for armed conflict and war and peace was constructed on the assumption that those who would be warring were states. Not having a state in the adversarial role greatly complicates the law as it does the policy. So obviously, I think asking a, a panel of lawyers, is the law real and does it matter? We, we have a vested interest in saying, yes, of course, the law is real and it matters. But I'm, my sense is, my response to that, that claim that we have heard for so long now, right, that international law is quaint or the Geneva Conventions are outdated, is I think we have a tendency to get a bit defensive as international lawyers about that question. And I think to flip the question back and to say, so what exactly would we do if it is outdated, right? So are we, is the person posing the question then going to propose that we have a treaty that says that you can deliberately target civilians? Are they going to suggest that we have a treaty that says that when fighting terrorists, you can firebomb cities, right? I think, and 
in most cases, I think the answer to that question is no. Um, so I think uh, there is a, that claim I think is often loaded with assumptions about what the law of war says that are not borne out by actually looking at the law and studying what it really requires of us. I think that the law of war is quite outdated. And particularly if we look at significant trends in the future of war, including the use of private military and security contractors, the growing use of new military technologies that we've been talking about this morning, we are stuck in a legal regime that was developed in a completely different era. And I think we're struggling to keep up. So I think we need a lot of reforms and changes. Well, let me, let me ask a, a really basic question. Um, what, is, what is war? Uh, can you define it for us? And, and I'm assuming that most of our audience are not lawyers. We lawyers don't actually usually talk about war. We talk about armed conflict. So if you prefer, you can, what's an armed conflict and how do we know when we're in one? And, and the final piece of that is, are we in fact in one with Al-Qaeda and its associated forces everywhere, somewhere, where? I'm I don't want to sound too flippant, but it's a war if nations decide it's a war. Because okay. international law basically is the law of nations. So if nations uh, you know, call it a war, conduct themselves as if it's war, there's, there's legal aspects that look at it. What's the intensity of the, is it functioned by an organized armed group? There are different things that we draw from, from different cases that help us with that definition. But it comes down to if a nation state believes it's a war, it's, it's going to be pretty much conducted. Does it war. bother you that many of the U.S.'s European allies do not think the U.S. has a war with Al Qaeda? Does it bother me personally? Is, is it enough for one nation state to assert that it's a war? Or does there have to be some sort of consensus among the international I think in, in modern society, and I'd love to hear what our, my mm -hmm. colleagues have to say, you're not going to get that kind of consensus because that kind of determination is loaded with other political considerations and including domestic considerations of various countries. But that doesn't mean that you know, the, the facts are, would show that we're in an armed conflict mm -hmm. if we're in an armed conflict with an organized armed group. The problem is uh, determining you know, the facts. How organized is it? How much of an armed group is it? Because we do want to distinguish international humanitarian law, or the law of armed conflict, from international human rights law and criminal law slash criminal law because not everything is appropriate for the application of the law of armed conflict. Charlie's put his finger on one of the difficulties here. It's a, it, there's more than one body of law at, at play. There is public international law. Generally, there is the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. There's international human rights law. There's the domestic law of any number of states. There's customary law, and we could go on. There are a number of specific treaties and agreements that may pertain to conflict of one sort or another, and we haven't even raised unique problems like biological weapons or chemical weapons or cyber. So it's an incredibly complex domain. The words matter, but they're not all telling. Yeah, I think I would, I would just build on, on what Charlie and Bill have said and say that I, th I think it's not only if states determine it's a war, it is a war, but I think in the contemporary context, if certain states decide that it's a war um, and begin to um, alter their understanding of how the law binds in those kinds of wars, then that may have a, an effect on other states uh, in a way that is based much more on sort of power politics than on what the law actually says. I do think that the political consensus around what constitutes war does, in effect, define war. Um, but one of the things that's been very interesting that's happened as we've seen the clear boundaries between war and peace blur is uh, the move towards looking at certain minimum standards that might apply in all contexts, and that is the relationship between human rights and international humanitarian law, for example. So I'm, 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 hearing, I'm hearing two slightly different things here, actually, I think, and I want to pull out the, the tension between them. Uh, one thing I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, there is such a thing as law and there are such things as facts, 
And facts relate to things like the intensity of the violence, how widespread is the violence, how intense is it, how organized are the actors who are uh, perpetrating the violence on one or both sides. Uh, and that, so we've got these facts which are objectively determinable, and then we've got this law which we can apply in some fairly objective fashion to those facts. And when we, we get you know, a sufficient quantum and frequency uh, and intensity of violence, um, we, we, at some point we say, okay, now we know we've got an armed conflict, we're simply applying the law to the facts. And I, I've heard you say that, Charlie. Mm -hmm. and, but I've also heard something which seems almost to be the opposite of that, which is the, the Humpty Dumpty theory of, uh, of language, right? Humpty Dumpty in uh, Lewis and Carroll's uh, Alice in Wonderland says uh, something, I'll probably get this slightly wrong, something to the effect that uh, a word says Humpty Dumpty means whatever I say it means. Uh, the question is simply who is to be master, uh, and that the powerful uh, are those who define terms, that the law has no independent meaning, that if a state, a powerful state, the United States says this is a war, then it's a war, uh, and that's the end of the story. But if that's the case, that's very different and that's kind of disturbing, because what if Vladimir Putin says, uh, what, well, what if China says we're at war with Uyghur dissidents? Um, and we in the United States say, no, you're not. You're, you're suppressing human rights activists. And they say, well, no, we're, it's, it's a war. That's what you said about Al-Qaeda. Everybody else disagreed with you. But uh, if, you get to, if you get to be the arbiters of when there's a war and when you can use force in a, in a law of armed conflict regime, which in some ways is more permissive in terms of state use of force, then why can't we do it too? Well, I, I should say that you know, what, how a state characterizes their conflict is one element. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that at least in this country, the law really matters because I know the military spends an enormous amount of effort trying to comply with the law and very complicated rules of engagement, which typically are more demanding than what international law would require. So if the, you know, theoretically most powerful country in the world is respecting law, then, then I think that that's, that's a, a powerful statement. There is always going to be disputes among countries as to what, uh, to how to characterize a conflict. And I would suggest that some of these things aren't new. That we've had gray area, we've had, I think, over 300 different deployments of US troops in, the, in our history, but we've only had, what, five or six declared wars. And we've had other times previously when we've had non-uniform people involved in, in war. We've had guerrilla war since the beginning of armed conflict. So these aren't all new things. It's how we develop uh, the law and international law, especially the law of armed conflict, is a developing area of the law, mm -hmm. meaning it always develops and it always accommodates new things. It doesn't mean that we don't need to make some specific changes here and there to address particular problems. But I think that the, the larger framework, especially when you get down to the core concepts, is as relevant today as it was any time. I think the problem we have today is uh, the decline of our, there's no reciprocity with some of our adversaries out there. And I think that that is a real challenge to the viability of, of international law. So I'm, I'm still feeling a little bit uneasy about whether we actually know what war is uh, sufficiently to apply in some principled and consistent way uh, bodies of law. And, and Bill, I wonder uh, if you, it strikes me that one of the difficulties right now um, with uh, looking at particularly U.S. counterterrorism uses of force is that since so many of those uh, drone strikes, for instance, not exclusively drone strikes, but that's one I think that comes readily to mind, since so much is, is in the covert realm or in the, the classified realm, we're left in a position of all those sort of objective facts about intensity, uh, duration, organized nature of the enemy that, that we're really left having to just take the government's word for it. How does, how does the fact that uh, so much of the U.S.'s recent use of force has been in the covert realm complicate our ability to, to tell the difference between war and not war and to apply legal yeah. categories? That's a great question and, and it's a difficult one because it, on the one hand, the United States has done, I think, an admirable job of developing a domestic legal regime to regulate the intelligence community, including covert operations by the CIA or other elements. On the other hand, at international law, one of the touchstones of lawfulness uh, of the use of force is accountability. 
And if you're unacknowledged on the battlefield, mm -hmm. you're not accountable. So even an operation as, uh, as well known and now attributable to the United States as the Bin Laden operation in Abbottabad, uh, was structured, at least in the planning stage, as a covert operation. There were intelligence committee mm -hmm. findings. There was a lot of work between special forces and intelligence operatives in the region and on the ground and back here. And it was conducted without the United States acknowledging its participation. Of course, after the fact, it was acknowledged, but it was not at the outset, at the time of the uh, in initiation of the operation, an acknowledged operation. That creates a problem of accountability at international law. What do we do about that, Nez? Well, I think my sense is that what we've done about it is that we have increasingly used policy. Um, and we, there's a sort of a catchphrase that I think we see more and more in speeches of uh, Obama administration officials and in many documents related to these issues that say, as a matter of policy, dot, 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 and then whatever the, the standard or the norm or the doctrine is. And, and my sense is we should be very concerned about that that the more we put into the realm of policy things that are sort of a blend of actually binding rules and then principles or standards that are in fact not binding rules, um, we, it, it both undermines the accountability that Bill is talking about and it creates a sense that trust us, right? So we're going to tell you what we're doing it's not binding, we don't see it as law, uh, but we assure you that we are acting in accordance with that policy. And I think it, that, is, that is creating a set of, sort of byproducts and unanticipated consequences that will come back to be problematic in the wars to come. Uh, can I jump in there? I'm in violent agreement with Naz. And she, by the way, she's written a wonderful article on this subject. Because, for example, the fact sheet that the White House put out on, on essentially drone strikes, it does apply to other things. It's a mixture of law, policy, it's a mixture of international law, international human rights law. But the problem with that is when you don't delineate exactly what you're talking about, which area of the law, it causes confusion and it results in people thinking that is the law, not understanding that some of those things are policy. What's the problem? When you get into a conflict like Syria, when you have to take off some of those policy restraints, suddenly it seems like you're backtracking and things are going wrong and, and you're, you're, you're not following the law or whatever. And I think it, it's very, very complicated for the general public. And I do think that there's some accountability in terms of drone strikes. There's not public accountability the way that we're used to seeing in other kinds of problems. But, but this admixture that Naz has identified in her, her writing is so, but, but does the fact that uh, a lot of the administration's statements about uh, what set of guidelines it regards as operative for, for instance, drone strikes outside of so-called hot battlefields, does the fact that there's a sort of mix of law and policy cause confusion or simply reflect a fairly honest uh, uh, awareness that there is confusion, that the administration itself isn't quite sure what the boundaries are of what's legally uh, permissible and is simply saying, given this legal murkiness, we're going to err on the side of adopting a set of policies that we think are sort of in the spirit of the law, if not consistent with the letter. And what, what's why is that so bad? But, I'm, I'm fine with policies uh, because rules of engagement, by and large, are mostly policy. But the problem is when you don't delineate what is policy and what is law and what in which which area of the law, you're, I think it creates confusion. But. So, so, okay, let me, um, I still don't know what war is. Um, I still don't, I don't know what war is and I don't know what soldiers are and I don't know what weapons are. And um, most of this body of law that we want to apply uh, depends on our ability to determine uh, when we're dealing with any of those things or any of all of those things. Let me, let me shift from asking what war is to focusing a little bit more on uh, what's a soldier, what's a combatant, what's a weapon. And, and Laura, you have been working quite a lot uh, in recent years on the, the rise of private military and security companies. Uh, this has not been in the news as much since the, it was in the, the sort of the peak of the Iraq war. At, at one point uh, during the Iraq war, uh, there were more uh, private military contractors uh, in Iraq than there were U.S. troops. 
uh, our coalition troops. And although that's sort of faded from the public mind, it hasn't gone away. If anything, on the contrary, we, we have uh, even greater expansion of the use of, of private military and security contractors. Uh, they're fighting ISIS. They're working with the Kurdish Peshmerga, you name it. Are they soldiers under international law? Are they combatants? How does the extensive state reliance on private contractors further complicate this question of when, what body of law applies and to whom? It, it complicates it a lot, and I'd like to link the growing use of contractors to new military technologies because to develop, maintain, and operate these technologies requires contractors. If you take one flight of one of the larger drones, the Global Hawk, requires more than 300 people, many of whom are contractors, whether it's maintenance, gathering intelligence, and so forth. So these two things are <coughs> intertwined. And I think one of the biggest problems in international law, let's assume we are in a war that is recognized as such, as such and accepted as such, is um, whether these contractors are either combatants or whether they could be considered to be directly participating in hostilities. Uh, if they are, then that changes the calculus in terms of whether they can be targeted. So is someone gathering intelligence, a contractor gathering intelligence that is later used in a drone strike, can that person lawfully be targeted or not? This is one of the many unresolved issues in the law of war. I mean, people have said things about when contractors should be considered to be directly participating in hostilities, but I don't think there is enough of a consensus on this point yet. <laughs> And I'm really glad that Laura brought up, I think is the real problem with contractors. Everybody thinks it's security contractors driving around trucks with, with machine guns. That's not really the problem. The more complex one is the one that she's identified, is the heavy contractual support of high technology. But let's say one thing. There's nothing evil about being a contractor. These are great, great Americans in, in many cases. We need, it's part of our asymmetric capability. But what we have to wrap our arms around is is how we are how we we should expect them to be considered and we have to be conscious of what they are being subjected to because some of those people may not realize it they are belligerents they are targetable and they're targetable on the same basis as an active duty military person even though they're living in you know, yeah. uh, outside of Fort Meade so, somewhere. So let's say, mm -hmm. hypothetically, Bill, um, let's say the U.S. Uh, were to rethink its uh, approach to the conflict in Syria and decide that since we're already uh, uh, using uh, airstrikes against ISIS, against the Al-Nusra Front, against assorted other people, that we might as well uh, use them against Assad's regime as well. Uh, so that would bring us into a state of armed conflict with the state. Uh, uh, and let's say that uh, somewhere in California or, or, or Nevada or outside of Langley, a civilian working for a private contracting company is assisting with some of the intelligence gathering that leads to targeting uh, that is uh, for U.S. airstrikes in Syria. Could uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime lawfully uh, target those people, assuming it had the capability to do so? Yeah, we, we look for symmetries yeah. in the law and fairness in the law. So the, the short answer to your question is maybe yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yes. Uh, and everyone ought, un, un, ought to understand that. If the person is taking responsibility for targeting decisions on behalf of the United States, he or she is accountable. And, and if we're in an armed conflict with Syria or some other state for whom the targeting is occurring, the, the enemy has the same combatant privilege as the United States does to fight that conflict and go after the, the combatant. There's a question, of course, here in Langley or in Nevada or in California, if there's another way to uh, defeat the, the targeting procedure or mechanics that are going on here, arrest, Mm -hmm. use of civilian police, that's a legal obligation that the Syrians would be unlikely to follow. I don't necessarily yeah. agree with that. No. Okay. Hmm. I've said enough, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. To make everybody <laughs> angry. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me, um, I mean, there, there's, there's too much to talk about and there's not enough time, but right. let me, just to get what I think are all the important issues at least out on the table. Um, 
How about what is a weapon? We, we've, we've, we've already talked about some of the murkiness in determining what's an armed conflict, what's a war, what's a combatant. Um, what about the world? How does cyber complicate this, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we talk very loosely about cyber war and cyber conflict and cyber attacks. Uh, when and under what circumstances, if ever, it, does it make sense to think that we're talking about war conflict in the legal sense rather than just the metaphorical war on poverty, war on drug sense, ever? I'll start us off very briefly. The, the legal framework for war is built on the conception of force and armed attack. The United Nations Charter structured around those conceptions to prevent against the use of force and to enable self-defense following an armed attack. If you think of cyber, Except in the rare instance, like a Stuxnet, cyber warfare, if you like that phrase, does not have kinetic effects. So the framework is ill-fitting. I'll stop there. And Except but. that it could. It could. It could. Stuxnet if, if, did. If you, you know, hacked into the air traffic control at, at Reagan and planes crashed into each other, then it would have that kinetic effect. But 99% of all cyber incidents from state on state are not at that Today. threshold. Yeah. To date. Laura. Right, well, if you disrupt communication systems and people die, then there are kinetic effects. Right. But I think that our thinking is shaped by a pre-existing legal framework from another era, and we're trying to adapt it to this new method and means of warfare, uh, and we're struggling, struggling to catch up. I think, I mean, in some ways I was thinking about this during the panel on, uh, on, bi on biological weapons and developments there where, where the um, experts were discussing this idea of the problem of analogy, right? So how, to what extent can you draw an analogy? I obviously have absolutely no idea. The substance of, of their discussion is outside of my realm, but to what extent can you draw an analogy between a biology and computers, right? So that doesn't make you say molecular biology as a field has fallen apart because we can't draw the analogy. I think in some ways, International law and the law applicable to armed conflict, I think there is, a, there is a lack of understanding of just how many people and how many soldiers and warriors today are applying that law um, in the armed conflicts that they are engaged in. And, and I don't think on a day-to-day -day basis there's this sort of postmodern Humpty Dumpty problem of, you know, what's a war? What are we doing? How do we apply the rules? But I think there is a sense that once we start to analogize out to conflicts that lack the very elements that these rules were built for, then you start to ask, well, what is an attack? What is a weapon? What is a victim of an attack? And let me, let me take that a step further. So, so usually when people say, well, there are certain circumstances in which you could apply the law of armed conflict to, to cyber, uh, they, they revert back to what Bill said, which is something that has to do with kinetic effects uh, and say, okay, uh, just hacking and messing with Sony might be embarrassing and annoying, but nobody is dead, whereas hacking into the air traffic controller system and planes crash or taking down the electrical grid and people in hospitals who are dependent on life support machines die, uh, that suddenly does start looking like uh, you may not have used a traditional weapon, but you had you had kinetic effects. People are dead. That was the that was the uh, predictable and intended effect, and it's reasonable for us to treat that as an armed attack, a use of force. It's reasonable for us to, uh, if we were say the victim of such an attack, mm -hmm. to respond ourselves using conventional military force. That we could we could use bombs or guns against those who had launched such a cyber attack. What if we take it a step further, though? One of the most fascinating and interesting uh, things that's been happening in the last few years, and Charlie, this is something you've been writing about recently, has been uh, the development of non-lethal weapons. Uh, weapons, uh, uh, we call them non-lethal weapons, the, well, the technologies that are designed to incapacitate without killing and in some cases without causing any permanent physical pain or harm. Um, what does it even mean to talk about those as weapons? If, if we have a mechanism to control human beings, if, if I could wave my, my magic new technology wand at the you know, invading army and they're all fall asleep for the next five days, long enough for me to go out and handcuff them all and you know, subdue them, and then they wake up and they have no memory of this and they feel just fine, but they can't fight me anymore because I've got them, 
Is that a weapon? Would that be a war? Does it, how do we even think about that kind of stuff? This is why she's so smart. Because, <laughs> because what she's right. doing I want my is, magic wand. is uh, she's disaggregating what Bill yeah. talked about, the idea of violence. Is it an attack? Because mm -hmm. an attack typically involves violence if you look at, at various international instruments. And, and I think she raises a good point, and especially when you move over into the cyber realm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's assume that nobody was killed by the cyber attack, but the stock market crashed, mm -hmm. and that will have an adverse effect, uh, hugely change people's way of life. Mm -hmm. I think that the norm is evolving, and I think Mike Schmidt has a new article out that that is, it, it's evolving. But we've seen that before in international Klaus law. Clausewitz is rolling in his grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clausewitz <laughs> said international law doesn't mean anything, but then he said, oh, war's an extension of politics, as if there's no relationship between politics and law, but that's... That's a so, three beer conversation. But, okay, but then where do, where do we draw the line, though? But because if we're if we're now saying if we're now if if my magic wand is a weapon, it's a non-lethal weapon. Um, the sleep wand. My sleep wand. Yeah. Everybody just falls asleep, and while they're sleeping, I you know I stick them all in jail or whatever, um, and I take away their money. They can't they can't fight us anymore because they're all sleeping, and then they wake up and they're fine, um, and I have subdued their entire nation. Uh, I now control their nation, I can occupy their territory, we can do whatever we want. Um, we would probably want to call that war, and we'd probably and, want to call and, that and, a weapon, and we do call them weapons. And I think we, yeah. and I think we would. I but, think. but then where's, where do we draw the line, though? What about economic sanctions? Why don't we call that war right. or a weapon in that case? What's because, the difference? Because the law isn't a cookbook. We don't have what? a total system. <laughs> you, know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the clients, when you're in the military, they always want a cookbook. Yeah, you know? I want a cookbook. I mean, I, they, a they, lot of you but, in the but audience the fact of the matter want a cookbook. Is, the fact of the matter is, when they do their job, they're always making assessments that are very specifically fact specific. They're eating soup and with knives. They're mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah, don't, totally you really are trying sorry. to cut me. You, you know, your soldiers wanted it on a three by five yeah. wallet. That's track. right. That's can't right. do that anymore. And that's why. Do you remember what uh, General McMaster said? He said that you have to get the troops to internalize certain values. Mm -hmm. You know. So, and that's really what you aim to do when you're actually executing the law. So I think that, you know, we saw norms evolve with Nuremberg. I was thinking about this recently when you never had individual responsibility for yeah. waging aggressive war. And Nuremberg court basically said to the Nazis, mm, we gotta start somewhere. You guys are unlucky. You're the first guys to get <laughs> so home So in, in, in just a minute, I wanna move to questions from the audience, but let me ask uh, Naz and Laura, can we ha could you have a nonviolent war in which no one dies and no one is injured? Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say it's a cookbook, but I'll give it a try. I think if you had the sleep wand, and yep. the, the part where I'm, I think the line drawing would happen is the element of control over other people, mm -hmm. right? So there's a sense that what, what, what is the law of armed conflict about? It's a body of law that says, when you come in to control other people, I thought when it was about are... preventing suffering and controlling <laughs> means and methods of war. Well, yes, right. So, so nobody's they, suffering; you want to they're prevent... sleeping. Happily. But they are so. You You're said you could occupy price. them, right? So if they're asleep and you can occupy them, so for example, the law of occupation They'll can be apply once I've when there's them. no resistance, That's right? right? Yeah. The law of occupation applies even in a case where the invaded country says, hmm. "Come on in." You yeah. occupy us, we're not gonna fight. Why? Because the law of occupation is meant to protect those with the, who are under the control of the other side. Right. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, yes, sleep wand, law of armed conflict. Okay, but that seems to me, everything is now war. I, we can exercise no. control over people in any number of ways. Yeah. Economic coercion, psychological coercion. Why shouldn't I just say it's all war, it's all weapons, uh, the law of war applies to everything. How, how, how do I draw any, I don't, okay, so I can't have a cookbook, but now I feel like there is no basis whatsoever for me to draw the line between sure. Sleep war one was war. still coercive in yeah. part, I, and that was Naz's point, isn't yeah. it? So are my sanctions. Well, yes. But, but yes. you don't think the law of war applies to sanctions. <laughs> I'd like to jump in, actually, and not answer your substantive oh. question. But uh, I, I actually think that you've highlighted the fact that w the law needs to evolve. And I think the big question is how? Because international law is notoriously slow and lumbering. And state dependent. And state dependent. So this is why <clears throat> I think we need to look more towards soft law, codes of conduct, and other processes for helping the law to evolve. 
we can take the evolution with respect to oversight and accountability of contractors as an example. So through the Montreux process, which was essentially a uh, soft law processes for states to come together and articulate how these new norms, how the existing norms ought to apply to contractors. I think that's a relatively good model. Mm -hmm. I also think that codes of conduct are important. And again, with respect to contractors, we have some really interesting developments in this area. The code of conduct for private security contractors is actually a very robust document normatively uh, in terms of filling some of the gaps in the law. And it was able to bring non-state actors, the industry, human rights groups, to the table in yeah. working out these gaps. Uh, but I'm not done making things more complicated. <laughs> um, let me go one step further still before we open it up for the audience. Itching um, powder. Not, so, so my magic <laughs> wand is, uh, lies in the future, but, but maybe not that much in the future, given technological developments um, uh, and the, all, the evolution of non-lethal weapons already. Um, another phenomenon that we have seen, both when it comes to uh, uh, drone strikes and when it comes in, in the future in terms of, sort of biologically linked modes of warfare, is what you could call the individualization of warfare or the personalization of warfare, you call it, Charlie, uh, that increasingly the sort of combination of uh, uh, very precision targeting technologies, whether, whether they're kinetic or, or sort of biologically DNA linked with the world of big data, uh, enables us to uh, do something that in some ways is, is fulfills some of the dream of uh, humanitarian law, enables us to distinguish with ever greater perfection between the combatants and the civilians. So I don't any longer have to, you know, firebomb Tokyo to get rid of my enemy and kill thousands upon thousands of people, most of whom are innocent civilians. Um, I can now say, I'm going to get that guy, that one bad guy, uh, and I'm with a drone strike today, maybe tomorrow with a biological weapon, maybe the day after tomorrow with my magic wand. So I don't even need to incapacitate all of my enemies. All I need to do is use my magic wand to hypnotize a couple of key leaders, um, and they fall asleep, and that's the end of their, you know, we then take over. So, so is this a good thing that we should all dream of and say how wonderful we, we, we can now, soon we will be able to be perfectly discriminating no one innocent will have to suffer. We can direct our non-lethal, painless, coercive methods only against the bad guys. Bashar al-Assad will fall asleep, uh, al-Baghdadi will fall asleep, etc. And won't it be a wonderful world? Or should, we, or should this scare us enormously as a sort of Orwellian future in which those who possess these technologies can assert near total control? And either way, should we call it war? Well, I think we should call it war, and I call it the hyper-personalization of war. I've written an article about this recently where we see the potential marriage of big data, drones, facial recognition, software where on the battlefield or elsewhere you can attack very specific human beings. And I think uh, Rosa has, has talked about the good side, but there is a dark side as well, because I think it I would, thought I was talking about the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> no, the good side is we're only killing certain, okay. certain people. I think it'd be very destabilizing for our armed forces, you know, yeah. because part of the ethic and the, the warrior code is that you're fighting for each other. Well, and that's the shared risk, and you would no longer have that shared risk mm -hmm. because only certain individuals would essentially be at risk. And it raises a new way of, of propaganda, so to speak, because in the future, adversaries with gathering big data will be able to go to the families of individual soldiers and say, we, we know where your son is or your daughter, and we're going to kill him tomorrow unless you go out and, and, and protest. And we see some of the things coming from, from some of the hostages that were killed, how powerful that can be in the national mm -hmm. conversation. And so I, I don't know where that's going to go, but mm -hmm. I think that we would consider that, that uh, war, whether we want to evolve the law to, mm -hmm. to prohibit mm -hmm. that or not, I think is something that worth a discussion about. I agree with Laura about that uh, wholeheartedly. But you know, while we're speculating about cyber and, and magic wands and the like, uh, we all have to remember that some lots of very kinetic, brutal conflicts are going on mm -hmm. right now and for the foreseeable future. Mm 
using... So this is a first world problem. It's a first to worry world about this. problem. Okay. Yeah, I think it is a very sad commentary that as much mm -hmm. as we've been talking about high technology weapons mm -hmm. here, the most horrific war crimes have been very low tech burning someone alive in yeah. a cage. Yeah. So we have, what, we, what have, more, we have the luxury of worrying about my magic wand and other people are being burned alive in cages. Which brings up, uh, you know, an underlying, I'd like to hear my colleagues on this, an underlying rationale for, or support for the international law of armed conflict is reciprocity. And Ken Anderson wrote something on this on Lawfare not too long ago, where he reflected on the fact that, that we don't have reciprocity really now with so many of the adversaries that we face. So, and that was always a powerful rationale for adherence to the law. Where are we going to go in the future? And, and I think that, uh, again, uh, HR mentioned it, it, it's ourselves and our own ethic. I think there's another part of it that, you know, I call lawfare, the maintaining public support. But I'm not sure that's enough. And that's, I'd like to hear what, well, let what me, my colleagues uh, If you don't mind, let's, let's, let's put that on hold for, yeah. for a few minutes. It may come up in the questions, and if not, we'll circle back to it before we end in final comments. But let me instead uh, invite people in the audience to uh, ask questions. Uh, press to introduce yourself and keep your question brief. Yes. Uh, you, Nadia? Let's see. Hi, Nadia Shadlow, Smith Richardson Foundation. So you're sort of alluding to this at the end of the panel, but I'm not a lawyer and I don't actually follow this issue that closely, laws of war, but it seems to me that this is a very Western-driven conversation, fundamentally. And who are your counterparts at a different conference in Moscow, um, in China, somewhere in the Middle East? Are there counterparts? I mean, are you working these issues day to day with, with um, you know, the other side, essentially. And if it is primarily a Western-driven conversation, aren't there just inherent limitations to it all, so? Well, in 1999, Chinese colonels wrote a book called uh, Unrestricted Warfare. It's really a monograph, and it's on the web somewhere, where they basically said exactly that, Nadia. They said, this is a Western concept, we're not gonna follow those rules, and if you go through there, they're gonna do everything. Fast forward to 2013, when they issued their their, their doctrine on the three warfares, one of which was juridical warfare. And so they have a very sophisticated way in which they intend to use law. They've actually operationalized it to a much greater extent than uh, the U.S. has. And you can see it at play in the uh, South China Sea dispute. They are prepping, I don't want to say the battlefield, but that, that's a you know, military phrase, but they're, they're laying the groundwork and the Russians, very interestingly, in, uh, if, if you listen to some of the things Putin talked about, he talked about Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence and how the ICJ blessed that and, hey, what's the difference? And so they are conscious of law in ways that they might not have been years ago. And I think it has a lot to do with globalization, something that somebody, one of our earlier speakers, or, well, is Harold Koch. Mm -hmm. He said that, you know, countries now have to have international law because of international commerce, in essence. And so I think that anything that happens in the commercial realm will bleed over into warfare. And I think we've seen law that way. So, long way around of saying is that I think short of an all-out, you know, kind of nuclear weapons case, the ICJ nuclear weapons case, where they go on for 400 pages how horrible nuclear weapons are, but... In the last paragraph, they say, but we can't say they would necessarily be unlawful in the case of the survival of the state as at stake. So I think that law, even though it does originate in a Western concept, is applicable and is thought about in other domains. It's also you know, part of the theme of the conference. If you think about the conflicts that are going on outside the kinetic realm now, in cyber, for example, the US and China, the U.S. and Russia, the U.S. and Iran, we're at one another in the cyber domain. And some would say that's a pressure release valve. It's a helpful way to ameliorate uh, more harsh conflicts. Naz, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, think, I take your question not being sort of are the foundations of the law Western, but is the conversation we're having today about these dilemmas very Western-oriented and driven? And my answer is yes. Uh, and I would add to that, 
I, I think there's a tendency when we focus on these sort of super futuristic questions uh, to think of this body of law as being only about targeting or only about killing or only mm -hmm. about weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what's missing in the conversation we're having on these issues is also the perspective of the communities affected by this violence, the perspective of those that are living through the, these many years of conflict um, and, and how do they understand which are the most important dilemmas and rules. And if I could just add that international law processes, while often fraught and contested, can provide a forum for um, global communities to um, have a dialogue. And one of the reasons why soft law processes and codes of conduct, I think, are really important places to take these debates is that they allow for non-state actors to participate in the dialogue. A question over there. Hi, uh, Yannick Askina, some uh, senior fellow with New America. Um, I must admit, I have so many questions to ask you. I don't even know where to begin. Primarily because you know, five lawyers up there, you're not charging by the hour. I'd love to ask you so many. <laughs> but we uh, actually are. We actually are. Yeah. So, so, so here's the here's I'll, I'll give you. A, We're going to be passing around a collection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, you mentioned and you focused on definitions early on in the discussion, which I, I think is fascinating and really important. You talked about uh, combat, uh, you know, different uh, combatants. You talked about different weapons and wands and everything. How about enemies in terms of defining the enemy? And my question really goes to specific thing about the Taliban and ISIS. They use similar tactics. They use similar... Uh, things they're killing Americans. They're not burning them in cages, but uh, wouldn't you call them terrorists? And, and what's the implication of calling them terrorists? And perhaps from your uh, legal perspective. Thank you very much. I think there are implications, probably more rhetorical and political, for calling them terrorists, which is that I think you have to choose, right? So if you're in war and you have an enemy in war, then you are fighting them on the however imperfect in, in, arm, in an armed conflict contest with the law of armed conflict applicable, which means if they lawfully target you, that is not terrorism, it is a lawful targeting. Not civilians, of course, uh, but your soldiers who are fighting in Afghanistan. If you want to frame it as terrorism, fine, but then you don't get to use the law of armed conflict to target them either. I think we have time for, for one more quick question. Uh, so let's see here. In the back over there. I have spotlights shining in my eyes, so I can't see you. Uh, my name is Intizar. I am from Afghanistan in the current Humphrey Fellow in ASU. Uh, so I would like to ask by uh, the quote of Sun Tzu, Chinese philosopher, and he said that the post-war challenges are more uh, disastrous if you remain uh, the, the enemy wounded and not killed. We are definitely uh, talking about the future of war, but there are some war remain bungling and incompleted. So my question is that whether there is a gap or a problem in line policy that should address the context, contextual need of the war in the United States, or there was a problem in practice, because we have a very good example of Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I, I couldn't really understand it. I couldn't either. <clears throat> I'm sorry, sir. I, I could not. 35 years in the Air Force with loud things have made it really hard for me to hear. So the problem is in law or policy that should define the war in enemy in Afghanistan, Iraq, or that was the problem in practice in the ground in Afghanistan because there were some strategic blunders we committed in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's why the war is not, uh, has been won the way that should be. You've silenced us. You've, you've left us no. completely <laughs> stunned in Law silence and therefore practice, there will be no charge for, for not answering your question. <laughs> um, uh, uh, no let me, let me, we're, we, we are, I'm told, I have a little red blinking light facing me, uh, so we need to wrap up, but the let me, let here. me just invite each of you, starting with Laura, coming this way, to offer any final thoughts that you would, you know, what, what, what would you like to leave the audience with on this sort of broad question of, do we need to make any change? Should we just say, okay, the law's good enough, it'll evolve, don't worry, this story will end happily, 
it just may take a little time, or, or are we in a crisis? How should we be thinking about this? I think the law is straining almost to the breaking point, and we urgently need evolution of the law. We need better processes for pushing the boundaries of the law and perhaps developing new norms substantively. And then the other big thing is enforcement and accountability is quite weak in these new areas. Um, and so I think we need to put a lot more effort and focus on accountability and enforcement. I think that I'm more worried, I'm not as worried about the law as I am about the conversations that we're having about the law. And my sense is that, that a, a group such as this and others who are interested in these issues um, should feel that they have a stake in the legal questions. That it's not only for lawyers to figure out or debate over endlessly, but that all of us have a stake in how these questions are answered and in the ways in which we talk about these dilemmas and to become more informed and engaged in how states and others are thinking through the legal questions uh, is, is for the benefit of us all. Uh, I certainly agree with that latter point. I think don't be afraid of the law. You know, we have this mystique uh, and we use funny language oftentimes but it, it is really uh, about the policy here and we're all informed and need to be participating in conversations about what the policy is going forward. Second comment I would make is that uh, states, including the United States, need to be more forthcoming uh, about their policy positions. I think the United States has done a better job in recent years at articulating what its policies are in various areas involving warfare. Other states need to do the same and we need to talk to each other. Just very quickly, I do think that the law is evolving. I, I don't think it's, it may be near the breaking point, but it's not at the breaking point. Uh, because it is being used, at least in, in advanced countries. Uh, I do think, though, that we need to do a better job at educating the lawyers as to the technologies and means and methods of warfare. I don't know how many conferences we've been to where you hear very erudite lawyers talking about the you know, the Hague Convention of 1907 and what somebody had said over coffee, but they don't know how a drone works. You hear people thinking that's like an autonomous weapon system or something like this. Uh, and so the law is developing, and Bill's made an important point. Uh, with Laura is correct in that soft law is helping to develop international law of armed conflict. But remember, the the Promoters of soft law don't have the same responsibilities as states. No NGO is responsible for the security of the United States. So states have a very important function, and they are not fulfilling that function. The opinion of jurists, and, and uh, my friend Mike Schmidt has written a very important article along this line. States have to be more forthright, because international law is fundamentally the relationship between states. And if they abdicate that to those who do not have the responsibilities of states, you'll see it develop in a way that uh, may not be to your liking. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, this ends our panel. This does not end today's uh, conference. Uh, next up is Admiral Michelle Howard, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. So please don't go away. Thank you all. Thank you.